This morning we'll make, two use of, we'll make use of two passages, but I think for our scripture reading, I would like you to turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, which will be a very familiar text. I will just let you... So it's 25, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. It reads, Therefore, I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor for yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit into his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they tore not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed in one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whatever, uh, what Withal shall we be clothed? For after all these things to the Gentiles, do the Gentiles for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. May God bless his reading, the reading, the reading of that word this morning. A happy Sabbath to all of us, to, to everyone. And uh, as usual, I think, uh, as I said last time, uh, it's always a great pleasure and honor for me to come back to the family line. Uh, and uh, I'm always happy to see everybody, to see Grace and the Jane and everybody who I've seen before. And uh, for me, that just testifies uh, the goodness of the Lord, how God is. Because things happen as you move from time to time. Uh, the next time I come here, may probably a few things might will have ha happened in between. But the fact that we are still able to meet again, as we have done, I think it's a great privilege that we need to thank God for. So we should praise God that we are able to meet again today, as we have done, and uh, just to worship God, to fellowship with one another. Um, I'm not preaching a new sermon. I think it's a, a continuation of probably what we've studied in our Sabbath school lesson. And I, I'm happy that you touched on some of the things that I wanted to uh, focus on today. Uh, it's been, maybe I should probably say the past 10 years have been, have not been very easy for me personally, uh, probably starting from 2006, maybe, I would have said probably from 1997, um, when my father died in 1997, I still had my, father, my, my mother left. So I wasn't, uh, yes, yes, it's something that affected me a lot. But I was comforted by the fact that my mother was still around. So she was going to provide 
for me, that parental care, that parental love that uh, probably I would miss from my father. I probably knew that my mother was still alive and she was going to be okay uh, to provide for me. But then 2006, things started happening and uh, my mother wasn't too well and uh, she deteriorated and uh, her health wasn't quite good. And then she, then suddenly I was still here I was here at the time, and I got a message that, you know, your mother had to be taken for an operation, but unfortunately, she didn't uh, recover from the operation. And that broke my heart. You can imagine, that broke my heart, how much, how I felt at that moment in time. And losing somebody who was so close to me, somebody who cared for me, somebody who I cherished, Yes, I had lost my father, but now this is my, the parent I was left with. And then um, that happened, and then three, four, five years down the line. So I'm the firstborn in the family, and uh, next to me was, is, was my brother, who was so quite close. I've got other brothers and sisters, but this particular brother was everything to me, and he assumed the position of, I was supposed to be caring for them, being the firstborn in the family. But then he ended up looking after me, caring for me in so many ways. And in 2010, 2011, he too fell ill, went through the same agony as my mother had gone through, went for an operation. He came from the operation, but then he never lived long after that, and then in 2011, we buried him. And then I kept on losing things, I kept on losing things. Things started happening and lost my job, lost my everything. So what I'm trying to make you visualize, think about, is the kind of worry, the kind of anxiety. Because I was always anxious. I've lost my, my father. What's going to happen? Now I've lost my mother. What's life going to be like? Now I've lost my brother. What's going what, what, what's gonna to happen? These are the people that were quite close to me, that I cared about, and people. these are people that cared more about me as well. And then I lost my job. Uh, some of you knew I, <coughs> I had to move to England to work in England. <coughs> but then... Uh, the job, I, I didn't, the project came to an end like that, and then we had to lose our jobs. And then I spent about two years trying to get another job. And we, in that period, I was saying to me, to myself, what's really happening to me? What's life really trying to treat me like? The text that we read, uh, the scripture reading, uses the word, the, this version I read from this morning, Jesus kept on saying, don't think about this and that, it uses the word thought. But uh, if I, had I read from the, East, uh, from the uh, English, the standard version, it would clearly say that, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. It uses the word anxious. Do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, know about your body or what you put on. So it, it says all these things. And then verse 28, and why are you anxious about clothing? So I just want you to pick that word, anxious, anxiety, anxious. And then verse 31, therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink? You probably agree with me that uh, being anxious or anxiety per se is a problem that affects has, or has affected many people today. This morning we were talking about, uh, 
Because if you are to define anxiety, you probably know that anxiety is about being uneasy or being fearful about something or worrying about something. And today, as we said in our Sabbath school lesson, at a global level, the world is worried, Europe is worried, Britain is worried about this emerging crisis in the, the, the migrant situation. It's a worry. If you saw the Prime Minister spoke on the television yesterday too, you could tell from his face that it's something that's bothering him a lot. He's not at peace. The leaders of Europe are not at peace with the situation. So globally, this is an anxious situation. It's a worrisome situation. It's a situation that everybody... So the fear is, what are we going to do with these people when they come in? Or David Cameron feels, and some of these people, terrorists, we may, may, terrorists may take advantage of the situation and just come in. And are all these genuine migrants, are all these genuine refugees? Or some of them are just like economic migrants? So the, those thoughts are lingering in the heads, in the minds of the, our leaders today. But I don't want to talk about that. We've talked about that in Sabbath school. But I want to talk about uh, personal, individual worry, individual anxiety that you and me face at an individual level. I was looking at... Uh, the NHS website, and I noticed that uh, there's a lot of information about anxiety. Our GPs today are helping people, are attending to people who have anxiety-related illnesses. So because of that, the NHS has published a lot of information, has put up a lot of information on the website, on the NHS website, about this condition, this, this particular situation, anxiety, in terms of what it is, or how it comes about. You see there's lots of information on it. And it also tells you how you can manage it. Because it's a problem that is being experienced in most patients or with most patients. Likewise, God is also concerned about the situation of when I am anxious, when I am worried, when I am fearful about things happening around me, about things happening in my life, God is concerned. And this is probably why uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, we have to read this particular passage because Jesus is, is saying, do not be anxious about anything. Then the, the question is practically, I would ask myself the question, what does this really, on a practical point of view, should I not worry? If I don't have food in my house today and I shouldn't worry, what, where am I, what's gonna happen? But God does not stop there. He provides a solution. I was interested when I read through the information that's on the NHS website. It says a little bit of anxiety can be helpful. So the NHS are saying, partly a little bit of it, it's not a big problem because a little bit of it is helpful. And it's helpful in the, in the sense that uh, it helps you to do certain things better, to prepare for certain things better. It says, for example, if you are a student, if you are studying, and uh, you're feeling anxious before an exam. I work for the SQA, and I have an experience of the kind of, especially this year, the exams that we, the, the students had to sit for this year, how much troublesome they are because we had to introduce the new qualifications. And uh, everybody was, was failing to cope. The teachers were coming to us and say, this is a difficult, these are difficult subject, we can't teach them. Some schools have decided to postpone them to this year, and the exam comes, and some students are worried about uh, maths, as you probably know. There was a general outcry about maths being the most difficult exam this year or last year. 
So that exam, so the NHS are saying, if somebody is anxious before an exam, it might help them to be more alert and it might help them to improve their performance. So in other words, they are thinking about it. They are thinking about it and they're trying to say, I need to do something about it. This thing is worrying me. Let me do something about it. So it, it's a positive thing in that sense. And then it came to my thoughts to say, well, there are some of us who have come across people when I ask them about it. For example, just as, as an example, the second coming of Jesus Christ, what do you think if we are to conduct a survey in our community and ask people this question, what do you think about the second coming, Jesus, the end of the world? Maybe use the word, the end of the world. Most people will come and say, we feel, we're worried. We fear that day. Because we know that day shall come. It will be a terrible day, you know. So people have that fear. But then if we are to go by the theory or the explanation that I'm not using the Bible yet. I'm using what the NHS say. The NHS are saying it can be helped. So if with that application, it might help me to prepare for the second coming because I'm kind of thinking about it and worried about it. So I'll tell people, if you're worried about it, then prepare about the second coming of Jesus Christ. So in other words, anything that bothers me and bothers you from the NHS perspective can be dealt with if you prepare for it or if it, the worry helps you to prepare for it. But then, the question is, I've shared you my experience in terms of what my worries have been over the years, over the past 10 years. What could be your worries today? You look at your own personal life, what could be the things that you are fearing in your life? What things are you anxious about? What things am I still anxious about? And you probably see that one of the answers that would come would be, I'm anxious or I fear trouble. I just fear living a troublesome life. If things are not working right for me, if I'm struggling, if I've got problems, health problems, if I've got financial problems, if I've got problems with my family, if I've got problems with my neighbors, if I've got problems in the church, so many things. What can happen? So we fear trouble. And it's something that we cannot run away from because trouble is part of the life or problems are part of what we have to go through in this life. You probably remember uh, Job, the story of Job when uh, he was struggling. And then his friend, one of his friends, came to see him, Eliphaz. And Eliphaz comes to see him to provide some comfort to him. And Eliphaz says in Job chapter 5, chapter 5 verse 7, he says, he, he implies to say, every person alive will have trouble, will have problems. In other words, we were born into problems. We were born into trouble. We were born into a, in a world of trouble. Therefore, we have to go through problems and trouble. Um, if, if somebody is comforting me with those words, I would look at them. But that's what uh, Eliphaz says. But then... If I'm, to go through, if I'm going through trouble every moment of our life, what's there for me? And I want us really to focus on the case of one person in the Bible. And this person, we find him in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 15. There's a whole story there of King Jehoshaphat. If you want to refer to Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 15. So this is a king who is ruling. Judah, who is ruling. Okay, if you are there, you will follow through, pick a few things from there in terms of 
What kind of fears did this king have? And how did he deal with his fears? How did he deal with that particular situation? Second Chronicles 20, from the King James Version, it reads, I'll just read some of the key uh, verses here. It says in verse, two, in verse one, it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other besides Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. <coughs> then there came some, that's verse two, there came some that told Jehoshaphat saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side of Syria. And behold, they are, or they be in Hazazam, Hazazon Tama, which is En Gedi. And verse 3 says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast through all Judah. So this is a development that's happening in Judah. It's been peaceful, it's been quiet, but then all of a sudden, Judah's neighbors, uh, the Ammonites, the people from Moab, rally against Judah. And they come in to fight Jehoshaphat. He's not prepared. You, if you read various commentaries, they'll tell you that Jehoshaphat wasn't prepared for this battle. It came as a, bit, a little bit of a surprise. You're living harmoniously with your neighbors, and all of a sudden, they gather against you. So Jehoshaphat, in verse 3, was filled with fear. He feared like anybody else would fear anything. But then what's interesting is what he did about his fear. He says in verse 3, he set himself to seek the Lord. And that gives us something to think about. What do we do when fear engulfs us? What do we do when our lives are filled with worry? Jehoshaphat decided to seek the Lord at that moment in time. And then he proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. So notice these three things. He seeks the Lord and prayed about it and proclaimed, asked everybody to fast about it. I don't know yet what our leaders have done. I haven't heard from David Cameron yet to say, we have this big problem. Let's seek the Lord about it. We have this big problem. Let's fast about it. It's only last night I saw in the news when uh, John Weobe, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, said something about it. But there hasn't been any religious solution that's been suggested yet. All they're saying is we should do something, we should just prevent the situation, we should help these people. But nobody has come with a watertight solution spiritually. So this king decided the first thing I need to do is to seek the Lord first about this problem. It happens as well in our churches. I've been to churches where you have problems. As leaders, you agree with me, fellow church leaders, you agree with me that leading a church is not as easy as it it always is, it's supposed to be. You still have one or two things that would cause you headache. Come Sabbath morning, you're kind of thinking, how am I gonna deal with this? And sometimes Sabbath day tends to be a busier day for you, a day that makes you worry about certain things. And what do you do? Do we pray about it? 
Do we seek the Lord about it? We all come from families. When problems come into our families, those of you who are heads of families, fathers and parents, what do we do? What's the first thing we do? Jehoshaphat decided to seek the Lord. Do we seek the Lord about it? And then you carry on reading verse 4. So Jehoshaphat has asked the whole nation to pray about it and to fast about the, the situation. And Judah gathered themselves together, that's verse 4, to ask the help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So the whole nation came to seek the Lord because their leader sought the Lord the whole nation responded by seeking the Lord. Now, the, what kind of influence do I give if I'm a leader in my church, if I'm a leader in my house, if I'm, a, if I'm a leader in my community? What kind of influence do I give to those people that I'm leading? Do they follow what I say? Jehoshaphat began by seeking the Lord, and that influence the whole nation into seeking the Lord. And verse 5 says, and he stood, Jeho that, that's Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And verse 6, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen, and in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. So you can see now Jehoshaphat is turning completely to God. He knows God can see him through this particular problem. So he's saying, you, Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? So I know you are God in heaven, and I know that you rule over all the nations and the kingdoms of the heaven. In thine hand, in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one is able to stand thee? So he, he is saying, I know God, you have all the power, you have all the strength, you got all the ability to deal with my situation. And I'm inviting you to come and deal with the situation for me. Sometimes when we go through difficult situations, we decide to take the matters you know, into our own hands. And uh, as a result, we do get a result that is not what we expected. But if we let God come in first, and if we know that God can turn things around for us, can turn adverse situations in our lives around, then we would go to him like Jehoshaphat did to say, Don't, I know you, God, can, you got all the power and the ability to solve this problem for me. You notice that he has faith and he has trust, not just his simple faith, but he has got great faith and great trust in God. And in verse 7 of chapter 20, 2 Chronicles, he says, Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before, the, before thy people, Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? So he's saying, I know you have done certain things for me in the past. I know you've driven out our enemies, and you've given this land to the inhabitants of, uh, to the descendants of Abraham. And verse 8, he says, And these inhabitants, or the seed of Abraham, have dwelt in this land, and they've built a sanctuary there in, in thy name. And he goes on and goes on and says. So what I want you to notice is that he remembered what God had taken them through in the past. Do we always 
think, sit down and think, when we going through difficult situations in our lives, have we always sat down to think about what God has taken us through in the past? What God has already achieved for us in the past? What God has already accomplished for us in the past? Sometimes we focus on the present situation, forgetting about the past. If we, as I said at the beginning, the fact that we are here today does not mean that we haven't met a lot of difficult situations from the last time, but God has seen us through from year to year. And here we are today, still living, still testifying of his goodness. So we should always remember what God has already done for us in the past, and that will help us to move on into the future. And verse 9, he says, even when evil comes upon us, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in this thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou would hear and help. So these are the descendants of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, who after gaining this land from, uh, who after receiving this land from God, they built a sanctuary, built a, a, a temple in this land, and they used this sanctuary to always call upon the name of the Lord. They're saying, we know that even if evil come upon us, so they are strong, they believe strongly that even if evil did strike them, even if a sword or judgment or pestilence or famine or any kind of crisis that would befall them, if they stand in this house, if they come into this house in the presence of the Lord and pray about it, they were sure and they are sure that God will hear and help them. That's why we are here today. Our meeting like this, in a sanctuary like this, in a church like this, should be for the people that we know that whatever we pray for, whatever we pray about, if we pray about it sincerely, knowing what God has already accomplished for us in the past, with all the faith and trust we have in him, he is sure to hear and to help us. And verse 12, I'll jump to verse 10 and 11. Verse 12, he says, Our God, will you not judge them, for we have no might against this great company that come against us, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Remember when we started reading this particular passage in Second Chronicles, we are told that it was a great multitude. So Jehoshaphat was told that a great multitude, a great army, a great problem, symbolizing a great problem, a huge problem, had come upon him. And then he didn't know what to do. Sometimes we do come across problems that are huge in mass size. And verse 12 says, for we have no might against this great company. This, we have no power against this great problem. We have no power of our own against this uh, great situation that has befallen us. Neither do we know what to do. We don't know what to do about it. But our eyes are upon thee. Our eyes are upon you, God. In other words, the whole nation of Judah, Jehoshaphat and the whole nation, had trust and full dependence on God, put their total dependence on God. They depended on God. They didn't depend on their own might. They depended on God to save them. And then verse 13 says, And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, not just the elderly, not that just the big men and women, but even the little children, the little ones like we have, their wives and their children. Sometimes when we are dealing with problems that affect us, 
problems that affect the church, problems that affect our nation, problems that affect our families. We sometimes even forget to include our little ones. But Judah brought, uh, Jehoshaphat brought everybody, including the very smallest boy. They came before the Lord, their wives and their children. Are our families involved when it comes to petitioning God? Or do we involve them when it comes to praying to God? Are our communities involved? This, is, this emerging crisis in Syria or in Europe is an opportunity for us as a church to involve our community, Let's sensitize them of the problem and sensitize them of the need to seek God at a time like this one. One passage I like is a passage that we find in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6, where uh, Samuel was referred to, I don't have time to go through the whole story, but it's one of the stories that I like. When a servant had been asked to look for a donkey that had gone missing, if you read that particular passage in your own time, and they didn't know where to get it, where how to find it, then they realized that there was a man of God in that city. And that man of God was Samuel. So they said, let's go to this man of God and he is going to show us the way. So the community knew that there was a man in their midst who would help them solve their problems. And I read this because I want us as a church to Put ourselves in that particular situation where the community that's living around us is able to say there's a group of people in our midst, there's a church in our midst, there's a church in, on Gordon's, in, in, uh, is it in Gordon Terrace, who would help us to solve our problems. Let's go and see them because they will provide a solution. They're not, 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 not financial a financial solution, but there are people out there who are seeking a spiritual solution, who are struggling with worry, who are struggling with anxiety, who are struggling with all sorts of problems in their lives. And they need to come to us so that we can help them. So that's the responsibility that we have. So that's what um, Judah did. They stood before the Lord with everybody, everybody involved, the community, everybody was involved. And then verse 14 says, Then upon Jehaziel, Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jer, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. So as they were praying, the Spirit of the Lord came. And the Spirit of the Lord said to them, Hearken ye, O Judah, verse 15, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not be afraid or dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but, the, but God's. So this is saying, we know that the problem you have is a big one. These nations have camped against you. These nations are coming to battle or to fight against you. It's a big problem for you. You cannot handle it yourself. But be not be, not be afraid or be not be dismayed by reason of this great multitude. Don't worry this, about, don't fear this great multitude. Don't fear this great problem. Because the battle is not yours, but whose? The Lord's. Sometimes we tend to think, we can fight the battle on our own and want to win it on our own, forgetting that the battle is the Lord. Even if we don't do anything, if God wants that battle to be won, it's going to be won because God is a victor. He's going to win the battle. So the battle is the Lord's and we should therefore leave it in God's hands to fight it for us. So whatever situation we could be going through, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, whatever circumstance our community finds itself in, 
whatever circumstance or situation our church finds itself in, let's leave it to the Lord. If we say, who is going to fill these empty chairs in this particular church? Yes, we make plans as a church. We should do A, B, C, D so that people can come into the church. But if we don't leave the battle in God's hands, if we don't put our dependence and trust in God, I'm sure whatever efforts we put in place will be in vain. So we should recognize that what we are doing is for God, and the battle is the Lord, and we should let him lead the way, and he is going to help lead us into um, success. So let's leave the struggles and the battles in the Lord's hand, for the battle is not ours, but his, and he is not going to lose it. Are we suffering the effects of the great controversy? When we see the great controversy uh, unfolding the way it is, and we are blessed as Adventists because when we see all these events happening in the world today, we know that the battle is raging between good and evil. The battle is raging between God and Satan. And what we see are the effects of the great controversy. This crisis in Europe is one of the effects of the great controversy. All the disasters we see in the world today, all the shootings, all the murders, are just the effects of the great controversy. Are we suffering those effects? And are we worried about them? If we are worried, we should know that God is still fighting the battle and he's going to win the battle. And this con great controversy will soon be over. So we should leave everything to, the, to God. So we should trust God and have faith in him. And then verse 17, I'll skip 16, says, You shall not need to fight in this battle. Sit yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. So God is, they are given the assurance that God will go with you. Do not fear. Do not have any anxiety. Do not worry. Go into the battle. He's, he, they're not told not to go into battle. They are told, fight the battle, go into battle, but trust in God, and then the battle will be yours. You'll be, uh, um, you will win the battle, for the Lord will be with you. And then verse 18, Jehoshaphat bows his head down with his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. So when we have that assurance that God is with us, that God is going to go with us, what is our response? How do we react? Our reaction is that we should praise God. And you notice as you read down that uh, uh, in verse 21, and when he had consulted with the people, so the battle had been won, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that they should praise the beauty of his holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy and forever. So they use, it doesn't say they, they, they must have had their physical weapons, but they use the musicians, the singers, to fight, to, 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 to praise God as they went into battle. We should go, we should face our problems with praise. We should face our problems with joy and even laughter because we know that the battle is not ours, but the battle is the Lord, and the Lord is going to finish the battle for us. And then verse 22, and when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushment. So you see the power of music, the power of praise, the power of singing. As these people began to sing and to praise the Lord, what does the Lord do? He sets ambushments against the children of Ammon, so he sets ambushments against all these neighboring uh, nations, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against, against Judah, and they were smith, smitten. You wonder, just music, just praising, just standing and praise God, that did the job, it did the trick. So in other words, what he's saying is, we should face our problems with praise, and the victory will be ours. So in other words, there's no need for us to worry. Don't worry. Don't despair. Don't be anxious about anything in your life. 
but leave everything in God's hands. I think the problem that I find is that we confess to be believing people. We say, I believe in God, I trust God. But when it comes to the practicalities of it, when we, on the ground, when things happen, we just have, our head just goes round and we forget that we trust in God. We just want to deal with the problem on our own. One of the stories that I found from, as we close, uh, from the Cornerstone class, I teach the Cornerstone class in Glasgow, and one of the stories that touched me as I taught that class is a story about a, a man called Charles Blondin, who lived between 1824 and 1897. He was a French tightrope walker, so you know these people that he do all kinds of stunts. So he would do tie rope at this end. And so this, he did this now at, um, okay, he started at the age of five. At the age of five, he went to the school of gymnasium in Lyon. Six months later, he had his first performance. So he was performing. He was interested in uh, uh, tightrope walking. Then in June, of 1859, he attempted to become the first tightrope walker to cross a tightrope stretched across the Niagara Falls. We have heard about the Niagara Falls. So he did put his rope across the Niagara Falls, which was over 100 feet of tightrope, 160 feet above the water. A huge crowd had come to watch him. So obviously people were amazed and interested. They wanted to see what he was going to do. So a huge crowd came to watch him. Um, he did all sorts of amazing feats. He crossed the tightrope on stilts, so he had he put his stilts on and then crossed the tightrope on stilts. He crossed the tightrope in a sack, so he put a sack around his body and then walked across he, crossed, uh, he even crossed it with a stove and a frying pan, sat down in the middle, so as he was halfway through, you remember he had, he's got a pan and a, a stove in his hand, and he's crossing, just walking along the line, and this is high up, okay, there's water below. He sits halfway through and cooked and ate an omelet. So he had time to cook and prepared an omelette and ate it. And what do you think the crowd did? They cheered. Yeah, everybody was so excited to see him do all that kind of thing. The crowd cheered their encouragement. And then finally, Charles took a wheelbarrow. We know who, those of you who've got gardens, a wheelbarrow. So he took a wheelbarrow. And what do you think he did with it? crossed the tightrope blindfolded. Not just so he had a blindfold on, took the wheelbarrow and then managed to roll it across from one end to another. Blindfolded. Blind, blindfolded. And then when he came back to the thunderous applause of the crowd, he asked if they thought he could carry a person across in the wheelbarrow. So he says, you've seen what I've done. I've managed to roll the wheelbarrow across. And everybody said, yes, we've seen that. That's exciting. That's interesting. And then he says, okay, do you think I can put somebody in? Can I carry somebody in the wheelbarrow and let them cross with me? And what do you think the crowd did? What did they say? Yeah. You're wrong. They said, yes. 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 <laughs> yes. They shouted. So they would, they would like to see somebody sit in the wheelbarrow and being crossed. He was the greatest tightrope walker of all the time. They had no doubt that he could do it. So they had all the belief that he could do it. He's going to take somebody in the wheelbarrow. Because they had seen what he's already done. So he's going he's gonna to do it. After all, he's managed to cook an omelette and eat it. He's managed to cross it in a sack. He's managed to do all these things. So what can stop him from crossing somebody in a wheelbarrow? 
And what do you think Charles said to the crowd? He said, he said, then do I have a volunteer to come and sit in the wheelbarrow? And what do you think crowd did? Silence. That the whole cheer stopped. <laughs> Nobody wanted to. The crowd buzzed and looked around. They gasped and cheered and watched, but no one volunteered to, to sit in the wheelbarrow. What was the problem? They didn't. They said they, they trusted him, but when it came to the basics, no, no. We trust God can do all these things, but when situations come, we just don't want to accept that God can handle it for us. Sometimes we claim to believe in God and we say all the right things, but when it comes right down to it, we don't want to trust God where it counts. Like these people watching this man doing all these kind of things, we shout, yes, 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 when we are asked if we trust God. But we certainly don't step out and get into the wheelbarrow. So we shout, yes, we trust God, we trust God, and people want everybody to know that we trust God. But our actions do not show that we trust God. May God help us. May God help us to have our trust in him in both good and bad times. To be faithful to him in both good and bad times. The words of the song that we sang at the start, uh, the last verse of it, be my, bid my anxious thoughts subside. Strong words. There's no need for us to worry. If we trust God, to the, even to the very basic level of it, <coughs> we shouldn't be able to worry about anything. Our anxious thoughts will all subside. They will all die away. They won't be anxious. The NHS will take all the information away from the website because they will say everybody is no longer anxious now. And want to think about the words of our closing song as we finish, which is day by day. I've got the words here with me. If we, Charles, do we have them on there? If we, let's have them on the screen. Five, three, two. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my father's wise betrothment. I have no cause for what? For worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind and beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best, lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. So mixing toil with peace and rest, mixing trouble. It's, practically, it's not easy to find peace when you are struggling, but we should find peace in the midst of our struggles. So let's stand as we sing that song together, thinking about the words of the song as we sing it. Such a powerful song. And such, those, those should be the words that we should be singing every day. That God should always, knowing that God is always with us uh, through tribulation and trials. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for speaking to us today. You know what each one of us could be going through. You know what each one of us has been going through. You know what each one of us will be going through. But tonight, uh, this afternoon, Lord, you have assured us that there's nothing for us to worry about. 
There's nothing for us to fear. There's nothing for us to be anxious about. That we should not be anxious about our lives, what shall happen to us, but we should always trust in you. So as we part, Lord, our prayers that you should help us to understand you more and to be more dependent on you and to put all our battles in your hands so that you can fight those battles for us and win them for us. We ask that you help us to help our neighbors, our friends, our communities, our country to understand the same, that uh, you are waiting for us to surrender everything unto you so that you can deal with all the issues that are affecting us as individuals and all the issues that are affecting us as a nation and us as a global entity. So be with us, Lord, as we part. Continue to bless us in these hours of the Sabbath. And as we are faced with another week, faced with all the other challenges, all the challenges that could be for us, they are waiting for us in the week that's coming, take us through all those challenges and help us to meet again here on Sabbath just to share our experiences and to fellowship with one another and to tell one another how good you've been to us during each passing week and each passing day. For this is our prayer in the loving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So may God bless us.